Hi, I'm Tom from Gear for Music, and I'm absolutely honoured to be joined by the Jody from Jody Jazz. And we're going to be exploring which saxophone mouthpiece is right for you. So have you ever had it where you're playing sax and it's not quite the sound that you're after? You want to sound a bit more bright, a bit darker, have a bit more punch? So I'm here with Jody, and we're going to have a look at how you can choose the right mouthpiece for you. It's certainly worked for me using Jody's method. So can you just give us a bit more information about how you would guide someone through choosing their mouthpiece? Sure. Um, so you're at a place, and we want to find out where you are now in your mouthpiece and what's happening, what, what you want to do differently. Do you, just like you said, do you want more punch? Do you want to be softer? Do you want to have a, a prettier sound? So we find out where you are and then where you want to go. Mouthpieces can change the sound so much. A lot of people, even professionals, don't even understand that because they haven't played a huge variety. So we can take a sound from super dark, quiet, kind of classical mouthpieces that keep you so a certain amount down on the farm, so to speak. They have a governor almost. You can only go so far. And when you're hitting that limit and you're trying to play more popular music, that's when Jody Jazz comes in, especially, because we take you to that next level. I know you do have six questions designed to help with that journey. I know the first one that you do look at is what is your current setup? Right, because that's exactly what we're talking about. What are you playing right now? What mouthpiece? Just because you're on a certain mouthpiece doesn't mean we're going to go similar. You might say, I'm on a, a Yamaha 4C or a Selmer C Star. I want my first jazz mouthpiece. So we're going to go to a jazz mouthpiece, probably with a more open tip opening, but not too much. Then we find out what instrument you're playing, what brand. It's just to know most of our, our mouthpieces will go with any horn, really, but they play differently with different horns. But uh, then we want to know how much you practice. Super important, right? Uh, because about what tip opening you can play. If you don't practice more than four hours, you're not going to be able to play a bigger tip opening. Because obviously sort of on mature development and things like that, so the more you play, you can easily get fatigue set in, so if you're not used to playing quite as long. Exactly, and that's four hours a week, uh, not four hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, it certainly worked for me. I mean, we sort of had a discussion about where I was in my saxophone journey. I play our own brand, Rosedale Baritone, and I currently play on the Yamaha 5C, and I, I was doing quite a lot of um, sort of concert band playing, sort of, sort of run-of-the-mill, sort of fairly standard pieces, but I just joined a New Orleans style band and I wanted something with a bit more punch. So how would, did we go on that journey together? Right, I think we said, go ahead and try the HR Star and the Jet. That would be my recommendations. And uh, the Jet has that extra punch because you're, you're in this band with horns, you're wanting to play with that sousaphone, right? And really punch it really out. sort of bounce off each other there rather than sort of feeling I'm lost within the mix. So, yeah. so the Yamaha 5C is great as a, a middle of the road mouthpiece, but just something with that bit more bite, that bit more projection was where I went with the mouthpiece. And, you know, I know one of the things we look at is reeds. So reeds can be a big factor as well. And it's important to obviously assess your setup with reeds as well as mouthpieces to make sure you get the right right fit. So I play on a Leger 2 on my baritone, so that was probably a little bit soft, so I went for slightly more open Jody Jets, and therefore the two suited me just well. Right, right. So that's the thing to remember, the most common thing is you're playing a mouthpiece that's a size 4 or 5 in that classical world. The reed that works is a harder reed because it has to travel less distance less distance, right? So you can play a harder reed to get the sound that you want. When you go to that more open mouthpiece, that reed has to travel further distance to get that jazz sound, which is buzzier than, than the classical sound. Softer reed usually works. So especially with that jet, the curve of the mouthpiece yes. plays into it. The shorter the curve, meaning that the curve starts closer to the tip of the mouthpiece, that's gonna accentuate the highs more really give it that more punch and a little softer read with that. Fantastic. So we sort of discussed the, the jet a bit more there. So should we really have a deep dive into the different mouthpieces? Okay, let's do it. The 
first mouthpiece we're going to have a look at is the Jet mouthpiece. So I know this is one of the big sellers. It's certainly the one that I went for. So how did this one come into development? What sort of things does it do for you that other mouthpieces don't? We wanted to make a mouthpiece like a, a good hard rubber mouthpiece, but that was brighter for people who, let's say, a lot of people associate bright with metal. And that's not necessarily the case, but, but people think a metal mouthpiece is going to give you that more brighter, louder sound. But a lot of people might not be able to afford a metal mouthpiece. So we wanted to make a hard rubber type mouthpiece that could take that place of the metal that people think they're looking for that brighter, strong sound, but still work in a straight ahead way. Uh, so it's not too bright. And what sort of context would this mouthpiece really lend itself to? You could go from your big band all the way to any pop or funk rock gig. So you can stay in your traditional jazz. And uh, talking about that facing curve, this one is starts shorter, to closer to the tip. So if a person takes less mouthpiece in, that might lend itself to that. That's part of why people like one mouthpiece over the other, that where that curve, that break is, is in the right place for them. So when I take the HR Star and the Jet out to a big band, it's about 50-50 yeah. what people take. And what one person loves the HR Star and the other person loves the Jet. So I always say, if you can, try them both. But if you want to play that louder, brighter thing, go for the Jet. Fantastic, let's give it a go. So you can hear Altissimo is really fun on the jet, and that's that shorter facing curve. It helps it. You're not going to become an Altissimo expert overnight. No, certainly. you got to do your work. <laughs> you have to do your work. But this is uh, really fun for Altissimo. And I, I'd like to give you an example that is more, let's say, more jazzy. Okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> So it does have that sweetness to it. Um, it's got a certain core and a straight ahead blowing feel that's really nice. So you can sort of get the more mellow out there because it's a bit more of a, a breathier sound, as it were, yeah. when you sort of take it back a little bit, exactly. but it's really got the, the punch if you really want to tank it. Yes, it, it just has more volume. So uh, often when we're playing in that live gig, as you know, you're getting buried by some of the instruments a lot of times we play with people who have knobs yes. and they go up to 10. <laughs> yeah, loud is better to a lot of people, so you really need to make that cut. Right, but this can be the equalizer. So the Jet is a great mouthpiece for jazz, but especially when you need that punch. Fantastic. That's the one to get. So the other mouthpiece that you mentioned there was the HR Star in comparison to the Jet. So how does the HR Star differ to the Jet? Well, the HR Star would be my first recommendation for anybody going to their first jazz mouthpiece because it's just straight ahead all around very versatile and not to say that it's the first mouthpiece because it's a professional mouthpiece we have Kirk Whalem and George Garzon we have world-class players on this mouthpiece it's very much a professional mouthpiece but it's right in the middle of the zone where you can play older styles and very new styles it doesn't have as much punch as the jet, as you'll hear, but it's got considerable amount. What we made it was the, the most traditional jazz mouthpieces uh, over time have been Autolink and Meyer, and we want it to be a little bit brighter than those because we feel like in the straight ahead world, music is still louder than it used to be in the 50s. And so. so it's got that punch that you'll they'll need. You'll find a big difference between your classical or your Yamaha 4C big difference of uh, volume. Fab, let's hear it.
So to me, it does have that little bit less punch, but it's still got the projection there that you need. Yeah, and you can do those, those variety of things, which is that really soft, pretty, or the louder. I'll try and do both of those. Um, let's see. And then the more funky. Um, So both extremes, so it's that versatile mouthpiece. Yeah, and it's a very easy transition from the classical style mouthpieces and just remembering that you'll probably use at least half strength harder, a less half strength softer reed. for one of the newer models so this is the HR star custom dark isn't it so I noticed there is a bit of a difference with its mouthpiece just by looking at it so there's the gold ring just around the base so where did that concept come from well the goal was to make the most beautiful sounding mouthpiece really dark warm pretty and so first I was thinking okay let's use our shedville rubber which is this softer composition rubber and so that can give a slightly warmer sound and then making this big open chamber the more open it is inside the more space the warmer darker the mouthpiece is going to be and but you have to give it enough little punch and so we're dealing with stuff inside there to give it the beginning of the tone and then warm it up. So there's a lot going on just in the concept and the design of a mouthpiece to really consider the sound that it produces. Yeah, and we always do hundreds, of, I mean, over 100 prototypes usually um, in there because I'm, I'm going for something. So, and I was sitting there one day and I was getting close to the sound I wanted. And, you know, we use, I used to love my power rings. And I had a tray of power rings and I was looking at the Soprano Sax power ring. And I was thinking, hmm. And with that, I grabbed it and I shoved it onto the shank of the mouthpiece and it worked <laughs> wow. and it, it adds a little body to the sound, like just this little extra thing because a lot of people are experimenting with mass. Yes, sort of the know, tone boosts heavy, and things like that. Yeah, heavy things on, on the, and that's like that. So the power ring is like that and then that. So that's how that came about. So it's really sort of helped transfer the vibrations and everything sort of that continuity and that solidity of sound, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I'm just a sax player. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, but, but experimenting in this stuff, sometimes I'm fascinated when something does make a difference. Sometimes you just feel it, don't you? You don't necessarily go 100% into the science, but as long as you feel it and it yeah. produces that result, sometimes that's the best way of doing yeah. it. So, so the difference in this one in that bigger chamber, very round. When you look at it through the shank, you can see that just big open thing. We also made curved sidewalls, which uh, kind of makes the sound um, a little more diffuse as opposed to a core that goes like that. You have this core plus this other stuff around the tone. So that's where the magic comes in. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Let's hear the impact. Okay. So it's certainly got that more mellow sound, but if you do push it that little bit more, I think you do get a little bit more brightness out of it, don't you? Let's see. <laughs> So it has that thing, and and uh, I've been 
shocked at how some of my contemporary artists are coming to the custom dark. Jeff Kashua, for example, he had his whole record done and he got onto the custom darks on soprano, alto, and tenor, and he retracked the whole record. Wow, so that must sort of show the impact. Yeah, and, and Mike Burton is one I think people will love to hear. He, he plays with Patti LaBelle and many famous pop stars. He's got a real soulful gospel sound in there, but he, can, he does it on the custom dark. And uh, it's, it's a really cool, versatile mouthpiece, but when you want to lean into the beauty of the saxophone sound, it's really nice. Okay, so the previous mouthpiece we've looked at are all ebonite mouthpieces or rubber mouthpieces, but now we've got one of the metals. So do you want to explain a bit more about the mouthpiece? Sure. This is the DV. It's our flagship model. DV stands for Da Vinci because I was trying to make a mouthpiece that had the volume you need in a live gig, contemporary situations, but didn't sacrifice any fullness or beauty in the sound. And you make volume by making the chamber and the baffle higher, smaller in there. It gets louder and brighter. I couldn't figure out how to combine those two, and I was reading the Da Vinci Code, the novel, and it talks about the golden mean formula, the golden mean ratio found throughout nature. The Stradivarius violin has all these yes. proportions. And when I read that, I said, I gotta try this in a mouthpiece. And I started measuring a mouthpiece that I had, and it led me to this idea of the secondary window, this opening under the reed where it's normally closed, the table. And by using Every design idea I had or a decision to make, I used this proportions in the mouthpiece. And it turned out to be this amazingly free-blowing, beautiful playing mouthpiece with that bottom that I wanted. So it's, it's like I say, it's our flagship. It, it's just been an amazing mouthpiece. It's my favorite mouthpiece in the world. And uh, people get hung up on metal or rubber. Uh, it's, we can make a metal mouthpiece be as dark and pretty as we want. What we can do with metal is manufacture the rails thinner. We can, because we have to have a certain thickness in hard rubber so it doesn't break or something, but we can make a rail very thin. And those thin rails that the DB has equates to quicker articulation, actually. A reed vibrates, it goes down and it stops for a millisecond on the mouthpiece. You know that because you get this thing that so it pop, pop, right? That's It stops and pops back. But when I have these thin rails, it stops for less amount of time. So even quicker response. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So here's a little bit of that. <laughs> It does really make those bottom notes pop. I mean, one thing I also worry about as a player is making sure the bottom notes sound and speak well. So having that sort of free blow in and that sort of body on the bottom end really does help. It's, it's pretty amazing. And, and I wish uh, people could feel how easy it is to blow. It, it's just an amazing thing. And, and you can get pretty. Uh... <laughs> Uh, and you can also punch it really hard. Um, As you say, for that volume of projection, that really does stand out. It's got it. So it surprises people every time. Straight ahead jazz players tell me, Oh, I don't want metal, and I said, just try this thing. Even alto players who are especially fearful of metal because most of the mouthpieces they've tried have been too shrill, too bright, and they are shocked when they play this. So I say, if you have the means, 
try this mouthpiece. It's amazing. Next is a DVNY, so the DV New York. So can you give us a bit more on how that differs from the DV? Sure. When I had made the DV, uh, some of my friends in New York and Boston said, we love the DV, but it's too bright for our style of music. And so I made a really dark mouthpiece, uh, but that has that DV freedom. That Because a lot of the real dark mouthpieces have a certain amount of resistance. And... So I've always been about making this the most efficient it can be. And so it's effortless playing, but it gives you that dark, beautiful sound. So, of course, we went real deep in the baffle lowered, big chamber. Um, and when you play, a, in this case, when you play this very big chamber mouthpiece, you're going to push in further. Yes. So don't be afraid whenever you get a new mouthpiece, push into wherever it's in tune. Don't worry about it's it. It's not like... Yeah. Make sure you tune up on a new mouthpiece before you play it. Don't assume that it'll be in the same place. That's one thing I've noticed sort of changing between mouthpieces. Think, oh, actually, a bit further off, a bit further off to what I'm used to. So it is really important because ultimately you play and you play with us, you need to be in tune. Yeah, and a mouthpiece plays better when it's in tune. When it's real flat or real sharp, it's weird. Things happen. So basically that was it. Again, making the really the prettiest sounding mouthpiece but the easiest playing. So there is a little bit less bite there, isn't there? So it is sort of that bit more sort of rained back, more sort of mellow sound. Yeah, and when you when you get a mouthpiece like this, it just encourages you to to dive into the the beautiful yes. parts of the of the sound. But again, everything I do, three things a mouthpiece has to do in in my Jody Jazz line. It's got to be free blowing. It's got to be efficient. So when you the energy you put in, you get plenty of sound out. It's got to have bottom in the sound. Even my super jet, the brightest mouthpiece we have, has bottom. Uh, it's got to have that bottom, and it's got to be versatile enough so you can do almost any gig on it. But this is definitely leaning to the beauty. But again, uh, we can get some volume on it. That really does pop. Yeah. Now, if you have to really bright sound, so the super jet really does give that sound, doesn't it? Yep. It's our brightest mouthpiece, but I call it brightness with sanity <laughs> because we still don't want to have fingernails on the chalkboard, and we want to be able to have that versatility that I'm always going after, and the bottom. So this has that. We achieve that with what we call a step baffle. So we have it pretty high, close to the reed from the tip, and then it steps down so that, that we try and get the bottom that way. This was a lot of experimentation. It looks simple inside, but a lot of experimentation, how long to make that first slope and the, the angles just a lot of prototypes to get it where I wanted, where it had that punch and the bottom. And it certainly has quite a lot of volume as well. Oh yeah, you're, you're just gonna, you know, you go in the band and your bandmates are gonna just go, whoa. Uh, Stripping the paint off walls as we say. Yes, if you need it, <laughs> yeah. So you can really scream out above everything that's going on there as well. It just sort of really gets straight out there. I know. It's like having, you know, a Ferrari or something. It's, it's the horsepower that you have that's so fun just to go over top as much as you want. 
you won't be buried anymore. But always as I do, like a... She can really go for that smoky flavor there as well. You can, you can. So reeds are so important and they can influence how the, the mouthpiece plays and also the sound. So for example, if your low notes are too hard, use a softer reed and you can get that uh, little foo-foo thing. If my reed is too hard, I can't get that. But if then you play up high and it sounds whiny and flat, your reed is That's too soft. To a bit harder. Yeah, so it's finding that balance and the sound you want. Softer the reed, the wetter, buzzier the sound. The harder the reed, that's bring start to bring in that air and that shh sound. Like Always Stan a key gets. consideration, isn't it, with with any mouthpiece? So change mouthpiece, change reed sets up. It's not just a case of changing the mouthpiece. Definitely, it's a one-two punch. The mouthpiece makes the most difference in the sound. The reed can make a huge difference in the sound and feel. Very important. We've now changed instruments. We've gone on to the tenor. So this is an intermediate tenor sax, so it's the Buffet 400. So I think this proves that you can explore with mouthpieces no matter what level of saxophone you've got and you can really make a big impact. Yeah, I think I'm getting a, a pretty good, you know, great sound out of this horn. For an intermediate horn, it's playing great. Um, and uh, so the Giant is what we're talking about, right? It is, yes. It's really one of our most unique mouthpieces and it's this crazy journey of experimenting with material and sounds. And um, so I wanted to experiment with aluminum because Pharaoh Sanders had handed me a mouthpiece that Coltrane had give, given him and it was aluminum. And it was kind of always in my head. And so I wanted to mess with that. But of course we want to make sure the player is safe. Yes, yes. Okay. So I knew that they make cooking pots out of aluminum and they're hard anodized. It's a, it's a plating, kind of a plating process that makes, it's very sturdy and it actually makes the material next to diamonds in hardness. Wow. Super hard material. So we took a real big chamber in this, bigger than our HR star, um, but in the end, maybe with this material being so hard, this mouthpiece can cut a little more, but it can have this big fat chamber. It's, it's a hard rubber shape, right? But it's metal. I say, it looks identical exactly. to hard rubber. And that's why we call it stealth metal. <laughs> but it, it, uh, it's a really unique piece. And uh, we have some people who just love it. Like one of our uh, kind of, he's known as more of a smooth jazz player, Derek Ron, just plays this and gets everything he needs out of it. So it's got that punch. Uh, it's just really unique piece that I love people to try. Let's hear it. <laughs> So I feel that's got a really rounded sound, and as you say, when you're looking for your mouthpiece, and sort of really got that sort of bottom end clear as well. Yeah, and you know why it's called a giant? It's called a giant because when I was playing it, it reminded me of Coltrane's sound, and we giant steps. So fantastic. Yeah, it's I'd say it's a very straight ahead mouthpiece, but that has that edge, and of course, again, you can play pretty on it. <laughs> and you could do the funk thing. So really hitting the altissimo there. Yeah, it's a fun piece. Okay, so the last of the mouthpieces on our list today is the DVC or DV 
Chicago. So why Chicago and what sort of player would this suit? Well, as I told you before, we had the DV, which is on the brighter side but with that big bottom. We made the DV New York for our players that were into more traditional jazz, very dark side. And then there were some people that said the DV is too bright for them and the, Chicago, and the New York is too dark for them. So we made the Chicago. No. To try and find a compromise there. Yes, and Chicago is known for its husky players, uh, husky tenor players, uh, big sound. So that seemed to suit it. And uh, it's not exactly in the middle between DV and uh, New York, DV New York. It's closer to the DV. So it's still got a lot of punch, a lot of brightness, but it is darker and it's got this big, 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 deep Dexter Gordon type of husky barrel chested sound. And in making it, we were going to make it all round inside. And in machining it, the first step was these grooves that we made. And when we tested it and everything, those grooves proved really useful. The way they take the air, you can't seem to overblow this mouthpiece. Fantastic. It's pretty neat. Let's hear it. Definitely a deep bottom end there, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be great on a blues gig, rock gig. It's for that person that wants plenty of power, but just wants a little more darkness and beauty. Again, it's got the super free blowing quality that all the DV series has. Super free blowing, so much so that most people report using a half strength harder read on it than they would on a comparable tip opening. Just to try and calm it down that little bit. It, it, yeah, the, the, it blows so easy. Yeah. So the read, the same read, just it feels too soft. So you, if, just don't be surprised. And again, we always say experiment, experiment when you're trying a new mouthpiece. Experiment with reads. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and you should hear maybe a little of that beauty part of it. Um. <laughs> So you do have that sort of smoky element there, but again, it's not losing anything on the projection. Yep. We've learned a lot more about the different range of Jody Jazz mouthpieces, so obviously something for every player. So it's important to optimize your sound as well, isn't it? Thinking in the six cues. Yes, and that is our one of our slogans is a mouthpiece for every player. And so by finding the right model, the tone that you're looking for, and then the right tip opening. We didn't go too much into tip opening, but again, by the six questions, I know how much you practice a week. And then if people go to the on resources under Jody Jazz, they find these tip opening charts, tip opening comparison. In the pink version, there's three colors. Yes. If you play four hours or less a week, go for a tip opening in the pink zone. In the green zone, if you play five hours to eight hours, you can play that most popular tip and only play the orange zone if you're practicing over eight hours a week and you, need, you know you need a big tip opening. Most people don't need a big tip opening, even the top pros play the most popular tip openings. And you can still get a big sound with the smallest tip opening. And as you say, it's really important to really consider your read choice and the rest of your setup, just to make sure that you're getting the sound that you need and really optimizing what you're after, aren't you? You've said it all. I mean, what we try to do on our end is um, make sure that when you get a mouthpiece from us, it's playing perfectly like our benchmark, like the best one we ever made. And that's been my obsession. Besides making these mouthpieces that play free blowing, that are really easy to play, is, is the historically mouthpieces weren't so consistent. Exactly. And it, that drove me crazy when I first got into the business. And so our methods of CNC machining, uh, 3D modeling, prototyping, and then just play testing every single mouthpiece 
uh, really keeps that. So I can be proud to have my name on it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for passing on your knowledge to us today. I'm sure that's been a really helpful guide to help people choose their next mouthpiece. If you've enjoyed the video, please click like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.